you can see I'm down here at the Mansion House, or as we would say on Squelga, Chalka Nord Vera, and I'm delighted to be joined for this uh, Christmas edition by the Lord Mayor uh, herself, Ord Vera, Crina Ní Dóli. Crina, fáilt a good uh, Dublin City of M and fáilt a good Council Matters? Gór Míl Amálgaf, is that slum of Vera, Ord um, I have, as I say be uh, before we came on, I've watched different people uh, come through the office or in the role and I'm particularly interested because yours is historical. Uh, you're the first elected Sinn Féin uh, mayor and I was there on the night you were elected. How did you feel on that particular night? It's, uh, it was almost like uh, you, were, you were making history and I think you felt you were making history as well. Uh, I knew I was yeah. um, but personally like it, I was nearly kind of I was, I was overcome by it all. Mm. It was, um, even though people were saying, oh, no, you know, it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, nothing's ever definite in, yeah. in politics. Anything, anything could have gone wrong. So in the back of my mind, it all was saying, well, well it mightn't happen. But when it did happen, yeah. I was kind of in shock, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and then I realized this is, this is a momentous occasion. Mm -hmm. um, not just for me personally, but for, for my party, mm -hmm. for other councillors, because mm -hmm. they took a leap of faith. But for the citizens of Dublin as well. Yeah. I found it particularly interesting because I've got the photographs of that night, and it's it's clear you are feeling what I would call the weight of history. But what was also very very interesting is is that you had a massive support system around you. Yeah, and oh, well, I, I'm very lucky in that. First of all, I have a really really strong family, and mm -hmm. um, um, we're they're very supportive and always mm -hmm. have been very and we're very supportive of each other. I have a really strong supportive party that I belong to, mm. but particularly my, my colleagues on the council, and particularly the new the, the, the new members, because we we've gone from five to sixteen, mm. and um, for the first time I have female company in yeah. my group. I was on my own for a very long time, and mm -hmm. um, I was the one out of one female out of ten yeah. at one stage. Then I was one out of eight, then I was one out of five, and now we're, we're nearly half and half. So. Yeah. That was very good. It was very good to have the, my feeling, my female colleagues um, surround me on the evening as well. Yep. Uh, as I say, the last local elections they changed the uh, the landscape you know, on a whole range of issues, gender being one, which I will come back to. But just uh, what something I mentioned to you when we met up the other night. Almost a month before that, I had met you up at the, the RDS at the uh, the Yes Equality count. and that was Crean and Edalig, the person. And then a month mm -hmm. later, I meet Crean and Edalig. The, or, the title in that sense of the word, it seemed like you did the two seamlessly and I thought that was a, that, that's a real tribute to the person. Uh, um, how did you feel going, as I say, they were momentous in a very, very okay. short period of time. They were, I mean, the, the marriage equality referendum uh, to me is a defining moment in, yeah. in, in, in our city, in our city and, but in our country. Yeah. And, and what I'm looking for is to, to harness on, on, yeah. on, on, on that goodwill yeah. and that compassion and that sense of fairness that people showed um, during that referendum. Um, I, I was I campaigned, I was at Camden nearly every single night. Yeah. Um, it was, I mean, I can count on one hand the amount of negative uh, feedback that yeah. I got, but the places in particular where I, where I found the biggest support was in the flat complexes in South West yeah. Inner City. Yeah. I had members of the Marriage Equality um, group with me in the likes of Oliver Bond, Dolphin House, Teresa's Gardens, yeah. and they could not believe the support. Not just the support, the friendliness, the people coming out onto the balcony shouting down, we're with yeah. you all the way, we'd be mm -hmm. all there. People in their 50s and 60s who never voted in their yeah. life before register to vote for that that's why it's that it was that important to them but what we need to do now is, is to build on that sense of fairness that sense of torch for equality because there's a lot of other marginalized communities a lot of communities that are excluded in this city and in this country and, and we need to build on that we are talking the same language as we say because you and i we're both dubliners uh, and May this year, uh, I'm not, I've am not. i never really been a nationalist per se, I've always been more an internationalist uh, in that sense of the word, but I really felt proud of being not only Irish on, in May, but Dublin. I mean, for once I thought, that is our voice, it's not other people speaking for us, that was our voice and it was just wonderful to hear, wasn't it? That was the people's voice. Yeah. That, that was, and that was without, like, and, and that, you've got to remember, at a time when, um, you know, at a time when the government didn't have great support, yeah. and usually anything. Look at the referendum. I know. That before, <laughs> usually, if the government supported, it's the kiss yeah, of death in it? some cases. But in this case, despite them, um, yeah. it, it was unanimously supported. Yeah. Let's go back to the uh, the very beginning because when I heard you talk, you you were. Uh, 
I think, yeah, you come from a slightly different decade than myself, but you come from the south side, I came from the north side, but they seem to be very similar experience in that sense if you grow up in working class Dublin, uh, as, we, as we both did. What's your earliest memories? Because my memory of the 50s is a very bleak memory. It was, a, it was an Ireland of high unemployment, it was an Ireland of high emigration, and if you grew up in many of the areas that we did, and I grew up in the north inner city, it was, also an, uh, uh, it was also an environment of low expectations. We didn't have great expectations for ourselves, and we didn't have great ex the Society really didn't offer you much opportunity. What's your memories of that period? My, mem my memories, well, my memories are of, of the 80s. Um, okay. And um, uh, see, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but in some ways, I was lucky, I was lucky in that because I was educated through Irish, I had to leave. I had to leave my community, uh, Dublin's Baron Crumlin, and I went to um, Strive Maid Villa uh, in town to go to okay. to to go to an Irish school, and then I went to Clash to Isagon. In some ways, that opened my eyes out to the inequalities in in, in mm. our city because I lived in Crumlin in Dublin's Baron, um, and yet I went to school in Stillorgan, and my friend, my school friends were from Fox Rock, Black Rock, Stillorgan, Killiney, mm -hmm. um, and experienced. Um, kind of a life that I never saw yeah. until then. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know people had um, tennis courts. I didn't yeah. know that people had croquet lawns. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that it was possible to have a swimming pool mm. in, in your own home. Yeah. Um, so it, it kind of opened my eyes, and I, I, it, it, that's what kind of made me think about how can this happen? How can you have yeah. such a divide in such a because Dublin isn't big. Yeah. And how can one section of society ha have accumulated so much wealth? And then I grew up in an area where I came home at night, and my father was on duty walking up and down the street protecting it from drug pushers yeah. because he was a, a member of the, the, the concerned parents in, in, in my community mm -hmm. and at the, at the time I was growing up my parents biggest concern was that we could end up on drugs we could end up take, being influenced by mm -hmm. drugs um, and they're, 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 and even now my mother says that was such a heartache for her because a lot of her children, lots of her friends' children died through drug addiction. Mm -hmm. A lot of her friends raised their grandchildren as their own children because they lost their own children to, to the scourge of drugs. Mm -hmm. So th th that is one of my memories of growing up was actually the, the, the local meetings, uh, you know, to, to, you know, to get drug pushers out to stop yeah. illegal drug dealing. So that's what my memories of my teenage years were. If I could move on slightly, do, you, you say that politicised you, and I would, uh, I could understand that perfectly because I know I, I had to go to university before I met those sorts of people. And what I then discovered, and I'm, I'm sure you found out the same uh, to uh, to that degree, is, is that these people were privileged. Uh, that's fine. I don't have a real issue in that. But they weren't any smarter than us, and that was the whole point. And what I realised with some of the people, uh, and now they're in very very powerful positions, is that they were conditioned in a somewhat different way. In other words, what you and I had uh, uh, aspirations for, they had expectations, you know, that you, uh, I have no doubt at the time, you probably had an aspiration to be in this office. Most of the people, I mean, I have interviewed people who had expected to be here, and then they expected to be in government, they expected to be a minister. Mr. Or a Supreme Court judge or something like that. That's a phenomenal uh, gap, really, isn't it? To it is, and um, I, I, I think to be a city of equality, we, we need to end that. Um, mm. you, your future shouldn't be determined by your postcode. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it shouldn't be determined by whether you're born into a, a social housing estate or a private owned estate. Even though I went to school with people who were very privileged, they were some of the most decent people I've ever mm -hmm. met. Mm -hmm. But you're right, that when we were filling in um, in sixth year, we're thinking what we're doing, I was thinking where I was going to go to work. Mm -hmm. They were all thinking of what university oh, we were yeah. going to go to. And it was a given that they were going to fit into CAO forms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I never heard of a CA, CAO form. Yeah. It, it was all new to me. But I mean, there was a very, very small minority of that school who didn't go to total level education. And that's what you were geared towards. I mean, nobody was like me and wondering where I was actually, where I was going to get a job, where I was going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, college wasn't an option due to income. What was your background? Did you have a family background in Sinn Féin? Was your, uh, uh, was your father involved? You were saying he was involved in the concerned parents? Or was yeah, he, well, when I say involved in the concerned parents, he was one of the parents that was signed up to, I mean, the, uh, all of the mothers, and the, the, the fathers in particular, 
um, signed up to a road up to um, sure. top of the street, end of the street, and anyone come in and out had to, had to belong to the street and all, because at the time it was rampant. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's what he, he involved himself in. I don't think he, would, he wouldn't have been involved say, in the committees and stuff, he just signed up to do his duty yeah, well, as he said. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, well it's protecting um, a neighbourhood. Yeah, yeah. we, we, we grew up thinking that everybody went protesting. We thought yeah. that's what all yeah. families did yeah. as, a, as a day out. Um, I mean, I would have been on Wood Key with my father, which is ironic. Uh, say Wood Key, I would have been on Irish language protests with him for um, t for what we have now for TG Cahar and for language rights. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I protest with him against censorship. Okay. Um, I would have stood on the protest with him um, every Saturday at Dunstores in Henley Street, uh, the anti-apartheid protests. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would have been on protest with him to do with uh, civil rights up north. Mm -hmm. um, the hunger strikes were a turning point in, they in were my in the early life. 80s, yes, um, yes. Up until then, I don't think any of us um, would have been involved in any political party, including my father. He was very much involved in language rights. He was a trade unionist. Mm -hmm. He was a devout Catholic. Um, he was involved in Mishnach. Um, actually, uh, I grew up going to loads of events in the round room because he organised all Cayleys and okay. Fashina there. Mm -hmm. So it was the hunger strike that politicised me and my brothers and sisters. That's again, a, uh, as I say, a very, a very interesting one because uh, I was going to ask you about uh, Onchonga. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but before I go to that, how would you primarily describe yourself? Because uh, the history of Sinn Féin from, if you like, the late 60s, uh, it, it, there's been splits, there's been uh, a whole range of evolutions, but at the time, um, the, the Sinn Féin that's there now, when it uh, broke off from the other Sinn Féin at the time, I would have said was more nationalist. It now projects an image that is more socialist, and that's, uh, uh, as I say, part and parcel of political evolution. How would you primarily describe yourself, then? Do you, uh, which would you tick? Would you tick the nationalist box first or the socialist box first? Um, it's, it's like, to me... Or are they both one and the same? In to, me, to, to me, it, 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 both are what I am. You know, mm. I, I, I couldn't have one without the other. Okay, yeah. Do we I mean, perhaps... So, so, some, people, some people are nationalists and wouldn't support socialism, I know that. Yeah. Some people are actually very afraid of the word socialist. Yeah. To me, um, socialism and nationalism work hand in hand for mm. me to be a Republican. It's very clear that uh, the Chonga notion that is very, very important to you. And uh, listening to you uh, earlier this morning, uh, I was going to ask how much it features in your day. Clearly it features an incredible amount. Yeah. Like, when, when I speak Irish or I'm amongst Irish speakers, I'm, I'm at home. Mm -hmm. it, it's hard to explain that to somebody. So what mm -hmm. do you mean? It, it's the language in which I am I'm comfortable in. Okay. Uh, when, when I hear Irish spoken, it reminds me of my father. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it reminds me of my youth. But it, it, it's also who I am. Mm -hmm. um, English is spoken. I speak English. I have to speak English. You need you English do, yeah. to survive. Yeah. But um, I love the opportunity to have Gaelge in here. Okay. Um, uh, uh, there's lots of Irish schools now requesting to come and visit because the tour is done through Irish. Mm -hmm. um, you seen there this morning, yes, there were was six, there. 60 yeah. children here yeah. Yeah. Um, this morning. We did a whole tour around the whole house with them through Irish. Mm -hmm. um, they sang on the doorsteps, they played the piano. Mm -hmm. And it was, to me, it was, the, 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 this is stuff that, that I had tried to encourage and it's working. Okay, that's very interesting because although I didn't go to a Gale school, I went to a school that pretty much we did every subject through Irish. Now, okay, it may be different with, uh, with females, but you know, we were North Inner City boys, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all, come on. And I'm going to be honest, uh, Gaelga at the time, it wasn't as hip. It was not as hip at the time. And I, and I often wonder, um, I don't have an antipathy towards the language, but I do have an antipathy towards the way it was it was taught. And I discovered when I was in Australia, I was much more interested in the language there. So perhaps there's the lesson for us all. It is. I, 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 I don't. When I was in school and I went to a Gaelic school, believe you me, it wasn't hip. Yeah. I, I grew yeah. up on a street in a working class community where we we weren't normal. We weren't the, yeah. the like oh, nobody. I can believe that. Oh, I can nobody went that. to an Irish school. Yeah. Like so. Um, as much as I was very proud of being a, a Gael Gore, I'm very proud and 
very happy uh, that my father raised to speak in Irish because I don't think I could have learned the language. I'm okay. not great with languages, yeah. so I got it the easy way. Yeah. So I have huge respect for anyone who goes in later life and tries to learn a language. Yeah. But uh, I knew we were different yeah. because I had to go and leave my community to go to school. Yeah. But um, And nobody on that street went to an Irish school. Nobody in that environment went. Now, yeah. there's at least 10 or 15 families on that street who have children yeah. who attend yeah. a, a local Irish school. Yeah. There's at least four extra Gael skull in it in the area. There's bat man skull in it. And there's, to me, in the last, I think it's probably maybe three years, there's been a total mind shift in people's attitude to the Irish language. Mm -hmm. And that's because we're normalizing it. It's not been forced down people's throat because you, you won't win that. You, 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 you know, yeah, yeah, you have to make the language, um, you, you have to make it appealing, but you also have to make it relevant to them. Mm -hmm. And when your child attends an Irish school, it becomes relevant to you then. Mm -hmm. and. Um, m m what I want to do is to, to normalise it. Like we have a lovely cram nullock outside here. Sure. Yeah. The signage is all in Irish. Yeah. You know, that didn't happen. Just little things like that where we ensure that uh, at every opportunity I will promote the language. Okay. Now, I also very much support Cunningham Gael to have, um, have a plan to have what they call a cultural quarter mm -hmm. in, in the heart of Dublin, okay. in and around Harcourt Street. That to me is a no brainer. That yeah. would be such a fantastic idea because it would be a tourist pull. It will be a cultural quarter, it will create employment and it, it also, like you have a cultural quarter in Belfast which is extremely successful. About a year and a half ago, because I do videos for the Jewish Historical Society, uh, uh, a gentleman um, pr uh, made a uh, presentation and he was talking about the attempts to revive Hebrew uh, in Israel and he was his, uh, the, uh, the attempts to uh, revise uh, around the time of independence in both cases. They clearly were much more successful. Do you th I, I'm in awe of how they did that. Yeah. And actually, I'm going to be speaking to the ambassador on Friday, and that's one of my questions. Okay, like, well, like, maybe I should send you yeah, my video. Yeah, we'll do, because yeah, they did yeah. it. The Basques did it. Yeah. So, now, one of the things is, one of the biggest problems we have is that English is the, is the first language of the majority of people of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And English has such a big pull. It's the language of pop, it's the language of celebrities, it's the language of America. Well, it's, it's the language, language of trade. Of, yeah, so it, 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 so it, it is the big, the big, yeah. like of, of any language, even French people, mm -hmm. even France will tell you that they have problems yeah. with the, the polluting of their own language through English. Mm -hmm. So un unfortunately, uh, the, the language we're competing with is, is English. Yeah. Let's move on from that to 1916 because the, you are going to be a pivotal figure in, uh, in 1916. Now I say to people, uh, 1916 to me wasn't an event. 1916 to me was the culmination of a process. Uh, in other words, we had a historical process that had gone on probably for a couple of hundred years that ultimately led up to 1916. Or do you see this was, people will talk about a glorious day or something like that. How do you see uh, the historical events uh, surrounding uh, the, the Easter Uprising. It was, it was a pivotal moment, but mm. there were other moments leading, leading up to that as well that mm. pe people forget about. But I think the 1916 was such a pivotal moment because um, the, the actual English Empire feared that had the leaders of 1916 won, mm -hmm. that it would, it, such like what they would call a small skirmish yeah. could have brought down the British Empire. Like the so, yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah, like yeah. you know, yeah. few small people. Yeah. But it, but it is such a pivotal, not just here in Ireland, because when I know when ambassadors come in here to visit me, or say foreign tourists might 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 drop in, and they'll say to me that you know they they know about the 1916 rising because it had uh, such a, an influence in their country like it gave courage to other nations that were colonized at the time mm -hmm. and that's that's what frightened the bejapers out of the british empire so, that this could be like uh, the moment that other small nations would also rise. So this was a yes equality day. It, yeah it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very much on so. A, on a macro scale. Yeah. And, but the only thing was that they didn't have as much support but what happened was as soon as they executed the leaders the, the, the support was unbelievable and yeah. everything after that then it, like with the, the war of independence the civil war all happened because of the 1916 rising yeah. we, we won't give credit to the uh, the bolshevik revolution for following us but uh, who, who could tell oh, yeah. who could tell Something on that basis then, how would you like to see it remembered? I mean, there are going to be a whole range of uh, formal uh, um, uh, commemorations and things like that. But what message would you like people to think uh, going forward for the next hundred years? Well, I think first of all, it's important to remember and to commemorate and to do so respectfully. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the key message is um, we still have not um, 
we still have the, the ideals and the aspirations of the 1916 mm. proclamation which is on my wall here and I read mm. it as often as I can you know we still haven't uh, achieved the goal set out in sure, that proclamation yeah. we still don't have an Ireland of equals yeah. we still don't have a, yeah. a, a free independent or two county yeah. um, republic neither yeah. so we still have a lot to achieve and one of the key messages in the proclamation was equality mm -hmm. you know and we still have a city of equality and I, I think the legacy that we could give to the men and women of 1916 was to actually fight for a city of equals. I wonder, did we perhaps have unrealistic expectations in the sense that everything was going to happen overnight as soon as you know, as soon as we got rid of the uh, the sovereign? Um, and clearly, it wasn't going to happen. And then what you what you're talking about, I see as part of a uh, a process. Uh, and what we had this year was an affirmation of national identity. We're actually talking about values now, and I think that's very very important. How do you feel about that? Well, it's, to me, to me th that's very importantly. When we had a launch here, I don't know if you were here last Friday, the launch of the 1916 mobile app, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's, a, it's a mobile app and it's an hour's tour of the 1916, 1916 sites. And um, to me, I was sitting there and listening to some of the people that are involved uh, 25 years ago in the 75th anniversary, and some of their stories, like, yes, we have progress because now we have at least the government are willing to help celebrate commemorate and honour the, the leaders. Back then, some of the actual commemorations were banned. Yeah. So it's, it, it's good to see that the government are actually rolling in behind this, but the most important element of all this to me is that the 1916 commemoration celebration need to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. They do not belong to any one political party, yeah. and that um, communities are the key to it, as far as I'm concerned. I want to see every single community, the length and breadth of Ireland, out commemorating and celebrating the leaders. But in particular, let's not forget the women of 1916. Yeah. Yeah. That's the next piece I'm going to come to. Women in politics. Now, last year was uh, the uh, the local elections. Phenomenal changes, particularly with Sinn Féin and particularly in Dublin City Council. Um, why do you think we've had difficulty? Get, I mean, out where I am, Dublin, uh, North East, never elected a woman TD, which I think is absolutely... Sh not in the history of the state, can you believe that? Uh, and there's no guarantee it's going to happen in this uh, time around in Dublin, North Bay either. And I think, in this day and age, that's shameful is the only word I could describe for it. You can't, that's, that's democracy, you can't force people yeah. to, to, to vote for somebody if they don't want to. Yeah. But um, Generally, they've never had opportunities either. See, 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 but see, this yeah. is it. I mean, even, mm. like, it, it's all well and good making gender quotas and, and forcing parties to stand candidates. But, you know, I mean, standing candidates and actually electing women and putting them into Leinster House and putting them into the positions of, of political power, mm. th that's the key. Yeah. Um, and, and, and to me, it, 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 I wouldn't have supported gender quotas when I was younger mm -hmm. or a, a few years ago. But now when I go into a room and I'm the only woman in there, mm -hmm. um, it makes me realise that we need to get more women elected. We need mm -hmm. to get more women in cabinet, we need to get more women in government. For the simple reason is, I'm not saying women are any better than men, mm -hmm. but that if you continually elect males and you continually elect one section of the population of society, you will only get their point of view. And to me, a lot of the cuts that were made to different community groups and, and different aspects, it's because that, that in a lot of cases, the people making those decisions have never walked into shoes of those people. Sure. Like, yeah. I mean, People making cuts on lone parents yeah. um, when none of them have probably been a lone parent in their life or have struggled yeah. means that they can't have any you, you, they can't have any understanding of what it's like to survive on that meagre yeah. income. So would you subscribe when I had my two minutes of fame on Vincent Brown? Would you subscribe to my view that economic policy generally disproportionately affects women? Yes. Yeah. 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 Most definitely. Isn't it? Well, and, and, and that's why I've said to people now we're going to address the the, the equality issue. We'll start with the fifty one percent. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. And this just came up the other night, so uh, uh, at the council meeting for uh, December. City of Compassion, you were saying you would hope Dublin would become a city of compassion. I always thought Dublin was a fairly city, compassionate city. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I actually think we are a very compassionate city, mm. but I'd actually like to have the status o officially. Mm. Mm. And I, I met with the, with the people who, who run the, the city, of, uh, city of Compassion. Mm. And what it is, is uh, the, ugh, with the resources and lack of resources within Dublin City Council, I don't want to be bringing any more work onto mm. anybody. Um, but when I sat down and went through some of the criteria for a city of compassion, it's very good. Yes, we yes. tick all those boxes yes, already. Yes. Like the, the age-friendly city, 
that was a huge initiative. That, and the, the amount of work that went into that, that would already make us a city of compassion. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at all, all the work that goes on, say, on, on the streets every single night mm -hmm. uh, to assist yeah. homeless people, there's the compassion. There's yeah. the compassion that's in this city. Uh, if it wasn't for that compassion, uh, the, the homeless situation to me would be a lot worse in this city. Mm -hmm. So we take a lot of the boxes already, but I would just like to have the official uh, designation of, of a city of compassion. Yeah. We're going to run out of time. It's coming up to Christmas, so would you like to say just a few uh, greetings, uh, just a quick greeting to uh, the listeners and, uh, and your fellow citizens? I just want to say, Nolik on a Dave Galair, Avlin Vuashi Eve, a great Gok Banak Agashia Kanar of Fihishi Jeg. Just to wish all of the listeners a very happy Christmas, a happy, peaceful, and prosperous 2016, and hopefully uh, 2016 will be remembered for not just the 100th anniversary of the rising, but for the year when we will become um, a, a country that's equal and, and has citizens that um, get equal opportunity. I've been privileged to watch the evolution of uh, Crean and Lee Dalig to Lord Ma Lord Vera or the Nee Dalig. Uh, so I just want to wish you no like Honig with because being no Honig with Lord Vera, and it's been a pleasure talking to you, and we wish you the very best for the rest of your tour. Good morning, Mahabat. Hey.